Welcome to the Jazz Ahead podcast. It is our third podcast, and this time Uli Beckerhoff, one of Jazz Ahead's artistic directors, is talking about musician-led labels. These musicians are from Austria, Germany, and Switzerland, and have founded labels on their own. We hope you enjoy this episode with its personal insights and stories. Welcome to the third podcast of the Jazz Ahead in this call. Corona times. Uh, it would be nicer that we could meet personally, but now we do it like everybody does. Um, I want first to introduce our guests to you. Uh, we have uh, Heinrich von Karnein. He's a saxophone player and a composer, and uh, he is he leads the Natango Records label in Graz. Um, Then we have uh, um, Robert Landfermann. Robert is a bass player and also a composer. And he is also, yeah, I would say, together with Tobias Hoffmann, the chairman from the Klang Collective, the Klang Records from Cologne. Welcome, Robert. And we have uh, Tobias Meyer from Zurich. Um, Tobias, I just wrote it down for me because it was impossible to cut. He is a Com it's composer, a saxophone player, voice, live electronics, words, lo-fi gear, movement, sound installation. Welcome, Tobias. And you are uh, together. It's also a collective, like the label in Cologne. And you are from the Wide Ear Records in Zurich. Welcome to everybody of you. Um, I would like to start with the most important question, and the word is why. Why did you found a label led by you, yourself, or, or a musician's collective? Because there are already a lot of, of, of uh, um, CD labels and, and record labels, but what was the reason why you founded this? Maybe, Robert, you could start. Yes, hello, nice to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, why are we doing a label? Yes, I mean, for one reason, it has always been a dream, so to say. I mean, to have your own label, to produce your own music, to be in control of every aspect of the of the whole production is fantastic as a musician. And uh, it's also from our collective side, a sign to the scene, I would say, to Yeah, to help lift people up a little bit, to build a platform for other friends, musicians, music that we like, to yeah, to help each other and to support each other. Could you tell me who are the your friends and musicians' colleagues in 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 the the Klang uh, collective? Yes, so we are uh, six people. Uh, it's the saxophone player Sebastian Kille, the trumpet player Frederik Köster, the guitar player Tobias Hoffmann, the piano player Pablo Held, and the drummer Jonas Burgwinkel, and me, the bass player. <laughs> okay. Thank you. The same to question to you, Tobias. Uh, why? And you are also a collective. Maybe you could uh, later also name, give us the names of your colleagues. Um, why did you create and found a, a level, level on your own? Um, I think it's a little bit a similar story to Robert's. Uh, but I have to say, when we started it, we started it maybe 12, 13 years ago already. Oh, that old. And um, mm -hmm. in the beginning, it was really uh, also just a practical thing because we wanted to release our own music then. And... Uh, it was too complicated and all these labels that existed already in Zurich and in Switzerland, we didn't really feel that we would totally fit in. So we decided, yeah, why don't we just start our own thing? And this whole idea of, of collectiveness or, or doing something for the scene, uh, building something for others, this came with time. So after, The time we realized what we can really uh, bring to the to the scene here in Zurich, and then became this this thing. But in the beginning, it was really just for us to to be able to release our own stuff. Uh, uh, 
so that it's not too complicated. Okay, Heinrich. Uh, there is always a personal history. In my case, um, it was the fact that um, I already was with a bigger independent label, um, first with uh, Intuition and then with ACT. And on Intuition, I had released the first uh, CD of a trio, which I started around 2007. And in 2000. 11, I was about to do another one and um, it didn't really fit into the catalog. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, in retrospect, I would say the label decision was a good decision for the label. I would probably have uh, decided similar. But for myself, it was like I had to release it. It was a free improvised uh, recording I did with an iPhone app and this trio. And for me, it was spectacular. I had to bring it out. But the the reason why I finally went for it was that this had been a story f in my personal life for quite a few years. I, um, You have to know that I started out as a management trainee in a publishing house close to Frankfurt in the very early 80s before I started music. And um, I had the offer in 1995 to become the executive of a new jazz label, which I've decided not to do because I want to concentrate on my music. And by then I was already uh, part of a university uh, teaching crew here in Graz, Austria. So, but then 2011, it felt like, well, if not now, uh, then I'll never do it. So this was the reason why I started the label. I saw, mm. for instance, Tobias, uh, your cat catalog is really big. I mean, I don't know how many CDs you brought out, but it's very big. Also, Robert's, uh, The Clang. And I see, I have the impression that, Tobias, your label is uh, pretty avant-garde music. Not always, but, but a lot of it. And Robert, there's more or less all the styles I, I know which you produced. How, uh, is it a program or did it develop by itself? Robert? Well, when we started it, we were uh, we were completely sure that we don't want to limit ourselves in styles of music or something, mm -hmm. just in quality. I mean, we also do festivals and stuff like that and concert series. And um, we have all styles that we like. I mean, today, I think it's pretty common for all of us jazz musicians and musicians in general to listen to Brahms and then listen to Billie Eilish and then listen to Radiohead and then to Coltrane and whatever, right? So um, that's what we want our festivals and our labels to be too. I mean, it's just a natural mm. way of developing the whole I mean, thing. This, I mean. this attitude uh, really changed over the years. I remember when I was young and 20 years and started playing professional music and all the older generations, they exactly knew what jazz is and how it had to be. I see with all the younger generation, thanks God, this really changed and I can hear it on your labels. Uh, Heinrich, behind your is probably more or less the same what the others said, the idea well, behind. I was thinking about it before we got together and I realized, um, actually, I have to say the reason why I started it was um, not only this record, but it was a conversation with Niels Wogram. And uh, I just had brought out this first trio CD and, um, and Niels said, oh, uh, you still didn't, hadn't found your own label. And I was thinking about the sentence for a second. Um, I realized quickly um, as far as I can see, there's like two kinds of musician-led labels. One is sort of a collective um, where you can produce quite a vast amount of CDs, um, but doesn't necessarily have to be a collective. I have a very good fine colleague in Austria, Christoph Peperauer, lives in Vienna. He um, has founded Session Work Records, which uh, got a, uh, which uh, has a really big catalog by now, and it's led totally by himself. The other kind of option is the label, the way I lead it, Natango Music. The reason is, 
Um, well, first of all, capacity. Um, I know there are labels who, for example, don't really care about the graphic art or they say, well, you just deliver the final master and we put it in the catalog and that's it. If you take care about those things, it's, it's automatically more work. And since I realized the production itself is something which I really like doing and the the look of the final product. I am, I still believe in a physical CD or LP. It, it, it's not the only way I know. I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not against any streaming service. Maybe we need everything today, and I am present on all those platforms. But the physical part of it, producing a product and then having, having it finally there, this is something what I really enjoy. I realized... I can't do more than really two productions a year. And then I said, okay, um, if I do it, I want to be involved in one way or another. So I did, for example, a very fine CD with the Danish bass player, Morten Ramsberg, uh, who I knew personally, and um, he had a beautiful trio. And I said, I would love to do it, but I would love to produce it. So this is what I finally did. I went with them to the studio and we did this production as well. Um, but I have to say, it's not um, the, in general, most of the productions I am in some way or another involved as a player. It doesn't have to be a band leader, but as a player. Um, it's just more a level of uh, a work of love for me in, in, in this case. So and again, it's, it has to do with the capacity, honestly. That, that, that means you decide what will... Uh, what productions will be done on your label, right? Well, I, I have, I'm working together with um, sort of a, call him a label manager, he's a really close friend, John Heitzmann, um, and um, who helps out, and, um, and my wife also, who helps out. But basically, it's my decision. Um, okay. And, um, but, but I have to go back for a second in the, in the 19, but I did my first production. Actually, I put it, I had this little tree here put up for this occasion. Uh, the first production I did was in 1989, my first LP. I was really proud and it was an LP only, it doesn't exist as a CD. I already took care of the graphic art and, and, and this was something with, after having worked with two of the bigger independent labels, I, I had the option to go to another label and again have to take care or sort of try to interfere with the graphic art and stuff or just to do my own thing and finally just be the one who was able to decide I like it or I don't like it. Um, part of this is also that I'm working with a graphic artist I really like working with for many years. She lives in Cologne, actually. Peter Hoffmann It's a wonderful um, artist. And um, this also is an important part. I would say this is also an important part for any label to have sort of a visual identity. This is similar as yeah. with books or all kinds of products. Uh, Tobias, how is it the decision process in your label, also later from Robert, who decides which production you would like to bring out and the other was what uh, Heinrich said already is there a kind of design identity we know from the old Blue Note label from ECM from ACT or so uh, maybe Tobias mm -hmm. um, the decision we're four people in the label mm -hmm. um, all of us are musicians so that's mm -hmm. uh, Alex Huber drummer and um, uh, sound engineer from Zug, mm -hmm. uh, Dalia Donadio, a singer and composer from Zurich, mm -hmm. and David Meyer, a uh, drummer from Zurich. And um, yeah, we, we uh, decide everything together, the four of us. And we also divide the, the work that we have to do uh, mm -hmm. among each other. So. Yeah. Uh, we don't really have a graphic identity. So um we really believe in the total freedom of our artists we have a lot of artists who have a um very uh, have their own ideas about the graphic design of their product or uh, we also have really special products sometimes we have a for example we we brought out some tapes cassette tapes uh, we have one mini cd we have a uh, several seven inch vinyl 
and all these artists had had their own vision about this product and we we don't want to stay stand in the way of their of their vision mm. but also we have a lot of graphic designers who we know and we're always uh, happy to to uh, connect the artists with these graphic designers so it's a little bit in between so there's a uh, we have many graphic designers who, who appear on several LPs or CDs. And, mm -hmm. so, well, we and don't have one. Okay. Uh, Robert, you are six, seven people in the... Uh, yeah. Do they all? Six people. Six people. And uh, Pablo told me that you are the minister, you and Tobias are the minister for the label. Uh, how is the decision process with the claim? Uh, it's basically like like at your collective, Tobias. I mean, we uh, all six of us we decide together. We all listen to the recordings that we get sent by by friends, by musicians, maybe somebody we don't know at all. We listen to it, and afterwards we just talk about it. And uh, what do you think? Do you want to do it or not? And if we want to do it, then we do it. <laughs> so the... If the artists still want to, yeah. No. Um, could you tell me something about the, the production conditions? Who is paying what? Um, no, nowadays, I think it's normally that at least the musicians pay the, the, the studio, the production thing. But then it comes to other things like the pressing, design, and so on and so on. How are these conditions at your label? Heinrich, could you? Um, it's, it's different. It differs. Um, sometimes I do collaborations with musicians. For example, I did this with Morton. I did this as well with um, Jazz Big Ben Graz. I have two productions, three, three productions out actually. And since I'm also involved in this band and this is, um, um, we get public funding. Um, mm -hmm. For example, Jazz Big Ben Graz is paying for the whole production. I am just, it just gets through my system, but I don't make any profit. Mm -hmm. There are other productions where I decide I want to do it and I pay for it personally like any other artist out of my mm -hmm. pocket. Mm -hmm. I try to use in Austria, it's probably similar in Switzerland. We do have um, a pretty good system uh, on various levels for public fundings. Uh, in my case, for example, it's the city of Graz, it's the province of Syria, and sometimes um, the AKM, which is the Austrian equivalent to the German GEMA, the, the mm -hmm. company, uh, the royalty company, mm -hmm. um, they have false, they have fundings for um, CD or LP uh, productions. So I'll, I'll, I'll always, I, I start an Excel sheet with every production and make up my mind what does make sense in this case or in that case. Uh, not always those public institutions um, are are good for 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 certain productions. It, it depends. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say the the financial part is the the biggest or one of the biggest issues. Uh, and after the first year or so, my respect for any professional label who did it or does it for more than 30 years went like really up. It's like, man, if, if, you, if you manage a professional jazz label and make a living, congrats. <laughs> because it's really hard. Because our numbers, of course, you cannot compare with the pop business. And it's... It's probably even worse than the classical music business, I guess. And I also have to say, additionally, I realized when a musician is present on the scene by touring, um, by giving concerts, by selling CDs him, him or herself, that really helps. And if somebody offers me a new production, I actually had a, a case um, where I really liked the music, but I, he, this musician said very quickly, well, probably we will not go on the road. I was like, and stepped on the brake because this becomes really difficult. It's difficult selling CDs through the traditional um, distribution channels. It's, it's still, probably you all agree, it still works, but um, I would say I read, I read the figure like it went down in the last year 
uh, for CDs for about 40%. And as, in as much as I can see that vinyls are going up, they do, but not great, but they do. I can see CDs going down, but it still works when you sell them after concert, for example. So this is also, this is also a reason to decide um, how you, if you finance it and, and how it will be financed. But very often to make it short, it's a collaboration with the artist where we just yeah. share the cost and then we also share the income. I, I mean, uh, I sell 99% of my CDs during concerts and the others are gifts to friends, <laughs> the rest of 1%. Uh, this is uh, so. And is there connected your labels with the publishing company? That means the very important thing do the musicians have, have to give the right uh, to your publishing company, or do they stay the rights stay with the musicians and the bands? Tobias, um, why do doesn't take any um, copyrights or rights for songs and music? So. This all stays with the musicians. Yeah. Um, also, our system is maybe a little bit different than Heinrich's. Um, I always say Wider is more like, um, maybe more like a platform also, where we mm -hmm. share our knowledge and our uh, network with the artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But all what concerns money is really through the artists. So they, they mm -hmm. pay for the whole production. Okay. They can keep all the yeah. income, so yeah. we don't uh, earn any money with the records. Does Clang exactly have a publishing company? The same, the same, same yeah. Actually, yeah. yeah. I think this so is... We just uh, built the platform, they can do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Also what you, what you said about the publishing, like in which mm -hmm. format do they want to do only digital, do they want to do tapes, CDs, USB yes. sticks, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> right? So um, they can choose that. We don't have a corporate identity. You said it too. Mm -hmm. um, because if we have like a experimental modern kind of music and like a pop music thing, it doesn't really make sense to, to have a corporate yeah. identity in a way that ECM or ACT or some, somebody yeah. like this has. And for the artists, I think it's great if they have like the freedom of expressing themselves and to yeah to make their own conscious choice about how it should look like. Right? I I know from your label, Matthias Nadolny was doing a, a duo with Bob Dagan and yeah, and he was very happy. He told me that all the rights stays with him and even the people he knows personally who wants to buy a record via via uh, a Klang. And then he, he talks to the people, you know, this is very personal. <laughs> and I, I thought this is really a very romantic way as contrast to the big business. Uh, but and I, I'm yeah, happy. We, we see it a little bit like a bio uh, kind of thing, right? Like directly yeah, from, yeah. The, yeah. from the producer to the consumer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, from the farmer no straight on the thing. table. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But I have a question to you guys. Um, yeah. How do you how do you finance any kind of promotion then? Uh, do you decide? Um, well, guys, um, if you publish it with us, then uh, part of the costs is the pressing, for example, obviously, and the graphic art, everything. But part of the costs you have to pay is also publish. It's also promotion, or how do you do it? Well. Um, for Wider, it's it's really all the work that we do. We do for free, actually. So when I'm working on promotion and uh, I'm sending out LPs or whatever, uh, this is really we we do that uh, for free. We don't take any money. Um, and then there's like a little a small amount, more s symbolic amount uh, that the artists pay, and this depends a little bit on how much they get, uh, how how much how well it is funded the record and then they sometimes give us a little bit more and we have more uh, possibility to to have some special promo event for example or stuff like this so this depends the, did i understood it right that more or less you have the label and the musicians on their own pay the productions for it the to in general the studio if necessary or whatever and they 
all the rights stays with the musicians and the, your label is more or less a frame for a lot of good, fantastic bands and, and bands you like to feature and so on. Is this right, the impression? Yeah, kind of, yeah. It's, it's a frame for all of this, but it's also like a vessel of all this knowledge that comes together. Mm. So we, yeah. we produced 50 albums and so we know a lot of people. We know mm. we have a lot of contacts, good contacts to journalists, for example. And we're really happy to share this and work together with the artists. And we're also really happy if the artist brings in his or her own contacts to our mm. yeah. collection. So you make some like promotion this, like that it grows. You make promotions from your label to rent a, a page on a, on a jazz magazine in Germany or Austria or Switzerland or... Uh... We tried that a couple of times, but it didn't really help uh, the sales. Yeah, <laughs> so true. we really uh, we uh, send out LPs and CDs to journalists that we know. We hope they write about it. So mm, mm. My, yes. my experience yeah. as a musician is when I read a magazine, a jazz magazine, they see a whole page advertisement of some label i don't really look at that because i know this is a paid one page advertisement so i really want to know what the journalists really think so this yeah, is our yeah. approach yeah um and i can answer this quite quickly we don't do any promotion okay so it's up to the artists too there's some people who want to send their CDs like to 200 journalists. Mm. We can provide contacts. We have like mm. a lot of addresses okay. and stuff from all those yeah. people. We can give out those lists to the people and they can mm. hire an agency to do that or they can do it by themselves or mm -hmm. to... Uh, so this is also completely up to the, to the artist. I, I heard quite often that young uh, musicians who come to the jazz ahead or ask me personally when I'm playing concerts or when I was teacher in, in Essen at the uh, Volkwang Hochschule, uh, they ask me, they got an offer from, from a label and uh, they have to produce the music themselves, the, the musicians, but they have to take about uh, eight by 800 CDs uh, uh, for eight euros plus uh, MBSD, Mehrwertsteuer. Uh, this is re really criminal be because uh, young mu musicians have no idea about the fact how this business is for musicians, jazz business is, is working. And because, uh, and I had to talk to a young singer, very good singer, uh, she had to buy a thousand CDs for, for including the taxes of ne nearly 10, uh, 10 euro. I think this is really criminal and betray younger musicians who have not these informations uh, you have. And I, I really uh, want you to tell young musicians when you hear about it, to tell them the truth. Because, uh, I mean, if you invest in a, a good studio and have to pay already the production and everything, and then buy for enormous uh, amount of money CDs from these companies are and s strange enough sometimes there are older musicians doing this I don't give any names but probably you might know if, if I might say something to this Uli, yes. or just add something because as a musician I would totally agree a hundred percent in a way yeah. um, having a label myself and knowing the numbers I do understand that it developed over the years. I remember in the early millennium years, I had a deal with a Swiss label, um, which was a fine, and it was like 400 CDs. Mm -hmm. And I did the math, and I would say it was about half of the production costs. And, and I include into the production costs, I always, in my case, I always include promotion because promotion seems to be a, a big part if if we talk numbers which maybe makes sense for a second i mean of course it's different for every company but i talked to many colleagues over the years and i i would say if i say a jazz you make you want to make a jazz cd um and you really want to bring it out my personal opinion is you need some promotion you, you need to invest money I mean, a, a, every product on the market, if, if Volkswagen or Skoda bring out a new car and don't do promotion, 
they sell they don't sell them although they might be fantastic yeah. cars so I, I would say including promotion 10,000 euro are easily spent of course we can make it cheaper you, you can have a live concert recorded it sounds fantastic it's one day in the studio mix and then of course the numbers are different mm -hmm. but uh, very often I try to do a production um, more I would say cheaper um, or with a more reasonable price let's put it like this and in the end I ended up with 10,000 if I included promotion and everything mm. so if a young musician approaches a label and the musician is sort of unknown to the public um, I understand the label saying well please sure. let's share this risk uh, w when you say 800 or 1000 it becomes ridiculous but a certain amount of CDs it's actually similar in the book uh, and printing business um, if you uh, produce a book on any kind of science for example um, um, then you you must be aware that you probably won't get any publishing deal without uh, paying a little bit but of course it's always I'm totally with you as a musician I'm with you and I tell my young students be aware you might have to pay something but be aware it has to be a fair deal for both sides definitely but that's what I th said is not was not at all fair and I think yeah. the, uh, more or less I don't know uh, Tobias are you also teaching I'm, I know that uh, Robert you were teaching in Essen and now you have a professorship in Mannheim or in Mainz Mannheim yeah in Mannheim mm -hmm. You are in Graz, Heinrich. Are you teaching in this official I'm school? I'm teaching as well. Yeah, not in yeah. a school, but privately. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, but I'm. I mean, we have to help young musicians. I know when I was 20, I just wanted to play. I was not able to play the things I had in mind, but I had to start somehow. But uh, um, I was very happy that all the musicians told me how things are going. Because when you are young, you have no idea. And compared the market from today, I mean, Jazz Ahead uh, um, is a positive thing, I hope, for, for, for um, you know, making contacts world, worldwide. But the business has become so difficult. And I mean, as Tobias, as you said, when the, there is a half a page on a magazine of advertising for six CDs, this doesn't help at all. There is nobody looking to it, to it more or less. To know how the market uh, functions, this is important, I think. Well, um, I have a very personal question to you guys. <laughs> uh, you are musicians. You have to practice. You, have, uh, you are composing. You are more or less managing your own bands or if you have play in bands who have managers okay but your own project probably I don't know you manage to, to get gigs you have a label and probably you have a family or at least you are living with somebody together how much do you work in general what would you as you assume how many you work with and around music per day? A bad question, sorry. Poof, mm. Impossible to, to measure, I guess, right? I mean, um, although I have a teaching job now, I still feel like a freelancer somehow. I mean, I play a lot and, and we all do. We, um, yeah, as you, as you just <laughs> mentioned there's a lot of jobs we all yeah. have somehow and um, yeah you work all day I mean it's a full-time job of course I mean uh, there's no Saturday or Sunday um, no, of course not. every day is the same um, you work as much as you can somehow and um, yeah um, but somehow I think it's the same for everybody that's uh, freelancing or like uh, how do you say, self-employed uh, person in the world out there who loves what they're do, doing or, or is involved in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah i mean with music it's it's uh, there's always something to do there's always some mm-hmm. record you want to listen to or some something you want to practice or some uh scheme you want to check out <laughs> like for your bands or some something to write or whatever i mean it never stops and that's mm-hmm. beautiful i think mm-hmm. i mean yeah, yeah. Uh, would be horrible to to be a football player or <laughs> something to stop <laughs> at 30 or 35 <laughs> um uh it just gets better and better somehow i feel yeah tobias what's mm. what's your opinion about this yeah i think it's um for me it's really uh beautiful that maybe this is the uh, same for you guys it's it, there is not really a division between this is my job and this is my free time mm. so it it really feels like either um i'm a uh, uh, i'm free the whole day or, or I'm working the whole day. I don't know. It, it mm. doesn't really make any difference. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's true. I get up, I, I make coffee. I already think about some ideas. Is this already working or is this in my free time? This division doesn't make sense for me. So this is, I think is a really beautiful uh, thing in this job. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's really fluent. I don't feel I like think... I'm working uh, 10 hours a day during seven hours, seven days a week. So I, I I actually feel like I'm. I don't work at all. I don't know. Just uh, don't, yeah. Exactly. I realize projects. <laughs> Heinrich, Heinrich. Oh. Well, I I wouldn't say that there is no pain involved. I remember when I was in my early thirties and I had my or late twenties. I had my first daughter. Um, I crammed in every half an hour I could. I jumped to one of my instruments or did something. And later when I heard somebody said, oh, I only have one hour, I said, come on, you have one hour, do something. So I, I would tell every young musician, you probably, you need a lot of self-discipline and self-organizational skills. And this comes over the years. But I'm totally with you guys, Uli Roberts and Tobias. Since we love what we are doing, we're not counting the hours. I would say it's at least 60 hours a week. Yeah, yeah. Um, and but it and it never gets boring but also sometimes i can't sleep because you know there's still i mean last night i was starting to play a solo on a uh, night in tunisia and it didn't stop it was a nightmare <laughs> it was going on you whatever it is um uh, you you finish something and you you directly know you have something else to do and so in a way it's beautiful and I wouldn't say that I had less to do during Corona. I definitely had less gigs, but because the label is is going and things are are are, are, are continuing, um, I have enough to do. And but it's also um, a blessing. It, it's yeah. really both it's a blessing yeah. and sometimes it's a curse. Like you know, like everything in the world. Yeah, I, I can. I agree totally with all you three guys said, uh, and. I had this question from from a journalist once, or even more often sometimes. How how much do you work? I said uh, I never worked in my life, and because the reason is what to be. I said it is so much joy. It is so interesting when I uh, more than fifty two years of professional life. What I saw from the world, where I traveled, how much. How many unbelievable, wonderful people as musicians, as audience, as friends, as from other arts. It's a pure joy. The only thing is, if you don't have a management to make your own tours, is a little boring or not, not very funny. And But my, my wife said to me, you're a happy guy. And normal gigs, 90% of, of, of normal work, 90% of the of the time people said it's it's negative and 10 percent is full of joy and with you it's different <laughs> 90 percent is joy in your work and 10 percent is a little bullshit. and i said yeah this is agree and i i'm, I'm totally uh, yeah i'm totally on the same side what all you guys mentioned sometimes it's it's exhausting but it, if you are exhausted, it's like in a tennis match, you know, when, when you play three sets and you're, it took three hours and, uh, and, and finally uh, you won. Who, I mean, this is fantastic. And playing in front of people, that people come to our music 
even if it's a small club with 30, 50, or a big concert hall with 800, or sometimes in Africa on tour with Volker Kriegel, we played in, in front of 20,000 people in, in Africa and in big football there. But it is such joy. And the, there was an investigation of the Deutsche Jazz Union, the, the 75% of the musicians uh, uh, earned less than 1,000 euros per month. But the question, would you take this profession again if there would be a chance? 100% of them said, yes, of course. And I mean, this is... Uh, this is we are blessed. very lucky. We are very lucky in this. Uh, well, have you, do you have any points we should discuss a little bit about, or uh, questions, or what? Uh, because I have I, my list is finished, and uh, is there something you really need to tell our listeners? I want to add. It's really beautiful to hear you talk about this, Uli. It's really uh, it's so beautiful how, how you say how much joy it is. Yeah, it is. I mean, you Thank know you for... it. And for, yeah. I mean, look, I studied the law for, for one year after I finished the, the school. And I found out, no, I won't be happy in my life. And then I started naive as I was in those days. There were no schools, there was no real book, there was no transcriptions. You have to do everything yourself. It was hard, but it was such a joy. Then buy, buying a new CD and there's a wonderful Freddie Hubbard solo on this. And then uh, you take the whole afternoon to find the same, how you say in English, Rille on the, on the vinyl to, to the bar you want to, <laughs> want to transcribe. I it was already a problem, but when it was finished, you you felt you felt like a king. Now I know what Freddie Hubbard is playing, and now I try to play the same again. I want to come back I totally to the. Agree. I mean, uh, yeah. it's it's so it's it's so much fun, and it gives you so much power. Uh, this is what keeps us going, but. Um, yeah, I, I feel like there's also a lot of stuff not going right or well. And 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 uh, now, of course, the, the topic of the day is Corona and and how politics are not really seeing our situation and, and not supporting us in a, in a yeah, uh, how do you say, like in a good way. Um, or the money is not really getting through to the artists, and yeah, I see yeah, a lot of people true. suffer. And and this is true. Um, and also, if I do, uh, there's a lot of aspects of of all the the jobs you counted, you know, yeah, yeah. That, when, yeah, yeah. that we do that I don't really love. Like, uh, I see that it's has to be done, and and I do it. Mm. But um, I mean. Uh, I, I love doing the label, for example, and, and it's a lot of fun to to yeah, to develop the whole thing. But if I would be really honest, I would think uh, we wouldn't do the label if there would be enough great labels, you know, out there mm. that that would say, "Hey, you can do whatever you want, and we pay yeah. you for it, and you have totally artistic freedom." Um, probably we wouldn't have. We wouldn't have gotten the idea of doing a label in the first place, you know? yeah, this, yeah. or organizing a festival. Like, if there would be so much amazing festivals with good money what? for all kinds of music, and probably we wouldn't have think, hey, we musicians, we have to do a festival as well, yeah. because there seems to be something that wasn't there already, which we had the feeling of, okay, we have to add this sort of like to the to the whole thing but i think this is also the very good side of the younger generations i mean we started to create the uh, um, uh, deutsche jazz union musica initiative was in those days like in cologne was the stuttgart and we started it but then came a period of about 20 years where nothing happened the the younger musicians don't do it and you are absolutely right what you said um, I mean, if you are privileged, like like you as a bass player, to play many gigs, and, and then it is not for possible for everybody. But uh, I've, I'm 
happy to see that younger generations take the things into your, their own hands and start to to yeah, organize them as f with festivals with everything. And I know in Klang you have I think every year two festivals, right, in Cologne, mm -hmm. which are managed yeah. by by the Klang Collective. I don't know. We do one in the summer, which is like one day open air, like ten bands or something, yeah. and one in the in the fall, which is three days with three spots or something on each yeah. day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tobias, if there's something also you are involved in, something like that? Um, yeah, there is, but, but it's not connected to the label. So okay. I'm yeah, organizing, but... I used to organize a festival in Zurich called Wiedeke Jazz Fest. Mm -hmm. Before that, I had a series of concerts called Seismogram, mm -hmm. uh, which took place every two weeks and then every month for like mm -hmm. seven years with it. That. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's a little bit different than uh, as Robert said i really uh, enjoy working on all these different levels of being mm -hmm. a musician so i mm -hmm. really enjoy of not only creating the music but also creating the platform mm -hmm. and i for me it's really like it's the same thing but on a on a different level mm -hmm. it's it needs the platform for the music to to exist and if i create the platform and 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 design it as I think of it, then it's, it's really part of the music also. So I, I enjoy mm. doing that. And I think even if there would mm. be enough great labels in Switzerland and enough great uh, organizers, I would still do my own series mm. of concerts mm. and mm. my own label. Yeah. Heinrich? Asking if I also organize something, I would similar to Tobias say, yes, I do. Together with Jasper Green Graz, we have a festival here. Uh, Jazz Redout is always in January. Unfortunately, not this year, of course, and last year. But the label, of course, is very present there. Um, but I was—I want to go back to the story you told us about um, the Freddie Hubbard record you found mm -hmm. on on Blue Note, I think. Um, the difference. And I remember I saw you, I was 19 or 18, I saw you in Noise close to Düsseldorf. I remember that with this band Riots. You were one of the first, you had one of the first bands in my life, which I really enjoyed listening to. And of course, I bought the record right away. And I would say up to the, probably up to the advent of the, um, of the CD, um, there weren't, it's, it's the sheer amount of productions which made things difficult and also mm -hmm. the sheer amount of musicians. The schools we are all, or at least um, the three of us are working in on a, uni on a university level, we poured out thousands of students. Mm -hmm. I'm in the system as a teacher since uh, the, the, the early 90s and I know what I'm talking about. The 1990s, the whole thing went up. Um, and I think it wasn't very healthy. Looking back, I would say not super healthy in a way, but the system fed itself. Mm -hmm. And now um, it, I remember when, even when I was young, um, I'm younger than you, Uli, but I'm probably way older than you, Tobias. Um, in the late 70s, early 80s, when a CD came out, it, you more or less, it was obvious that you bought it at one point. Mm -hmm. And... Um, this makes the production of this probably is a reason why we are there where we are today and i would still do i would still release a cd and i would say the 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 financial aspect the economic aspect is only one aspect um because um it helps you being staying active and present on the scene Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why I would say many artists probably invest in their publications, uh, knowing that it does help them, although the revenue, the financial uh, revenue isn't that great. But it's not so, if, if, I mean, I'm always saying um, Henry Moore, the, f the famous artist who did those huge copper um, sculptures, first of all, before they were sold, he he uh, financed them for himself and one of those pieces was like 80,000 euros i once heard mm -hmm. so um sometimes you have to invest in life and um i would say as an artist and also running a label 
if you if you love something you have to do it and you have to go for it and you even have to invest um, economic funds in a way yeah. um, in the future I don't know how much it will be really let's say CDs we talked about CDs and LPs we know that streaming is a big issue I know that many musicians don't like the idea at all uh, because it is a difficult issue and I can totally understand if a musician says well I do not want to be on Spotify but um, my it's really a personal thing my personal um, uh, view is well I do not argue against Netflix it would be stupid I, we have our local cinema around the corner but I love Netflix and it's just a new format coming up um, with Spotify the difference of course is a, a streaming service like Spotify does not produce um, exactly. a, a record like Netflix does produce a movie there is a difference that's, yes that's a big difference and I realize yeah. the, the, the revenue is not that big unless you make it I had this for one title only actually you make it to a certain playlist and you have like let's say 80,000 streams suddenly you can see in your bank account I would say for many young people and especially not necessarily jazz fans but like the average people who say yeah I like jazz yeah I'm gonna listen to, to some jazz they have no problem with it I would say if they pay for it cool um, and, and if the money reaches it, 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 the musicians the composers and the music this yeah. is the most important thing exactly you know, yeah. I mean I have nothing against uh, and, and I, I was sitting in my favorite uh, uh, cappuccino uh, shop around the corner here where I lived to, during a break to go there to read a little newspaper and then go back to work and suddenly there was running a tune of mine on, on this radio there and I asked the guy uh, um, Paolo uh, how, where did you get it it was the French I never heard the name it was the French thing where like the Spotify I never got any money from this never but I mean it is what it is the technology and the game are the same uh, they it, it takes time and it will be new uh, one last question did the JS ahead help you in any way it helped me big time in 2008 we had the chance uh, by invitation actually of you to perform with Jess Bigman Graz our then new program Electric Poetry and it led to festival gigs in the following years Jazz Baltica, the Jazz Fest Berlin etc many festivals over the years as you know we we met uh, on several occasions and it I think it's a really important um, platform for all of us for the European scene and you you uh, it, it may sound funny even the Austrian scene met once a year at Jazz Ahead because Austria is not only Vienna or not only Graz the Graz people say well first it's Graz then it's Vienna um, we all live in different biotopes in a way and um, it helped big time and I, I would be very happy if we have the chance to meet in person again uh, because I think this is a wonderful thing for the whole mainly mainly for me European scene but I'm happy to also see that and Jazz Ahead went international uh, because all those influences of course obviously are very interesting and you see many names which you might have not seen or heard uh, sorry for that question I, d I don't want it to have a personal <laughs> ownership for, for the, the, you but I saw Robert probably you are one of the musicians who play the most gigs on in different bands on the uh, do you have an idea whether it, it was a positive thing for you or if it wouldn't be there it wouldn't matter anyhow well uh, it depends on the bands I think I played with some mm. bands it really helped and other bands they didn't get, get any gig <laughs> more mm. Mm. after this it's it's really uh, and it's also hard to tell why or why not because it's not like the most experimental bands got the less gigs or something uh, you never know I mean and there's yeah. a lot of stuff going on like people meet there and they talk about something and it just materializes years after that mm. or something so mm. Mm. It, Sometimes it's hard to connect which happened where and why. Yeah, and yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Tobias, have you been ever? At, uh, um, we have we have been with the label. Uh, yeah, I don't remember. Maybe five years ago it was. We've yeah. been there, and presented YD Records, mm -hmm. and like Robert said, it's really hard to say how it helped us. But mm -hmm. first of all, it really helped us to to um, uh, make this presentation about our label mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. define okay, who are we exactly. And then we made some really important contacts with journalists or with other labels. Mm. So this was really helpful. So this is mm. singular contacts with uh, persons who were there also. Yeah, 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 yeah. This was really nice. It wasn't like uh, we were suddenly we were world famous <laughs> after no, Jazz Ahead, no, but uh, no. it was really subtle but uh, important. And, and, and then and also for, for David, who is also part of our label, David Meyer. He's played a couple of times at Chester. He played there, and I, I know. think. Yeah. yeah, and I think for his band, it was, re for example, it was really important. So, yeah. But for us as a label, it was more subtle. Uh, it is very important to get this feedback. We try every year, but we try to improve that it really helps. And this is my, I'm the only musician in, in, the, in the team. And I... I I always want to know what can we make better for the musicians. That there are some bands more in what way ever more uh, yeah, successful than others depends also, I say, on the, on the music. When there is very um, popular jazz uh, things, they sell better than complicated bands. This is for true, for definitely. And, uh, but especially for those bands like uh, Robert you are working a lot of these bands who play fantastic but it is not easy listening jazz it is very emotional concentrated intellectual jazz I like very much but it, it does not find uh, everybody in the audience and at the jazz I had yes but not in regular concerts depends where to play the problem is we are living now in times where marketing is the most important thing. And a, a journalist asked me in an interview, what did change of, after all these years you were uh, in the business? I said, the difference between the way when we started the first 20, 30 years was uh, the quality of music, which made it successful or not. And this changed. Now, today, you have to, to be honest, you have to say the, the quality of marketing. I, I do agree, Uli, um, but also I believe that every artist yeah. has a certain time frame. It feels like it feels mm -hmm. like suddenly the time is ripe for the artist. And uh, thinking about, for example, somebody like John Hollenbeck, the drummer, who I yeah. was affiliated for for a minute. Suddenly he was hot. Everybody wanted to do something with John. And then mm -hmm. he did something with the Hetzische Rundfunk Big Band, and he did, I think, two fantastic records with them. His music, if you listen to the Claudia Quintet, is yeah. quite abstract, although I think it's very physical. I love it, and, mm -hmm. and he got his audience for it. So I wouldn't say it's, it is, you are right in many ways, like probably Till Brunner, who we talked about before, might probably sell more, but he has to sell more if you're with a big label um, in a way, but not necessarily. It, it can be an artist um, when the time is ripe and this is something, as Robert said, you never know. It's hard to predict. Mm -hmm. Like um, we just talked about our, my good friend and your good friend, Sebastian Gille, who is part of Klang. Suddenly the time was ripe for Sebastian and mm -hmm. he's a hell of a player, but he is by no means commercial, not at mm. all. Mm. But the people, he gets his audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah this is true. It's also something which is hard to predict, also probably very hard to predict for any label. Uh, you need, uh, as we say in German, a good nose um, to, to, to smell, to smell it and, and mm. go for it and, and have the right people together in the right moment. Yeah. Right? I would say uh, if you don't have much important things to say anymore. Um, thank you very much for this wonderful conversation with you and, and also for me personally, it was very interesting to see how your labels uh, are working and uh, also successful working. 
and uh, I hope to see you guys, if possible. This year, Jazz Ahead will be only um, digital. If there is a chance to get an audience in it, we'll, we, we will have audiences. But uh, I hope at least in 2022 we can meet again. And I wish you big success with your projects and uh, hope to see you soon and again. Thank you to all of you. Thank you very much, Uli. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Uli. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, bye. guys. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> yes. Thank you for tuning in. Follow us for more podcasts, listen to other episodes, and we hope to see you again soon in our different online formats.